looks like it's a time to get uh, started. And today we'll talk about uh, running mm, databases uh, or uh, in containers all the way through uh, having a mm, database powered uh, uh, let's see something just popping up okay so we're going to talk about the databases and inspire from a, a container to database uh, as a service in uh, in Kubernetes now uh, on this Kubernetes we, we are, we, on this uh, talk we're talking a lot about uh, how uh, the Linux is, uh, has turned 30 this year. Now, I am too young to be using Linux 30 years ago, but uh, I came reasonably close to that. And I remember the early days of open source and how complicated that was compared to what we have to deal with now. Right? I remember a case where if you want to run some open source software, typically you have to download the source code, and then maybe you have to figure out what is the proper compiler version to compile it on, or find some patches for that to work exactly on your software uh, version, and, uh, and so on and so forth, right? I would imagine some of you also had that, uh, uh, that experience, right? Which was, you know, uh, uh, quite uh, complicated. And then from that, we had the never-ending drive to uh, simplicity. Not just an open source. I think in uh, technology overall, became much more easy to use uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of decades. But if you look at uh, their software in Linux space in particular, we can see this path where we started with, hey, you download the source, you patch it, uh, you compile it to then Target Z binaries and kind of install scripts we started providing, right, which was next level of uh, simplicity. We still have quite a bit of stuff to figure out, right? For example, you would need to ensure you have uh, a proper version of libraries, right, installed uh, and stuff like that, right? But it was much uh, easier. Then uh, we went even further, having the packages at Deb and RPMs, which uh, offer dependencies, so you don't have to figure out what particular library version this thing needs. And then uh, uh, YAM uh, repositories or apt repositories, right, to even install everything they need right now, right? And uh, uh, finally, if you look at something what you do install, we got solutions like uh, Docker and Snap, which simplify that even further, right? For example, if uh, as a uh, developer, uh, as if I use Docker, it's very easy for me to install, let's say, multiple versions of the same software or similar software which would uh, otherwise kind of conflict with each other. For example, in my SQL space, if I would want to install in a normal Linux packages way, both MySQL and MariaDB side by side to try them out to see what works better for me. I cannot really do that because they conflict each with each other. They use kind of the same data paths, but they uh, use a different um, uh, data formats. But if I'm do using Docker, I can uh, do that uh, quite uh, easily. Okay. So uh, here comes database in uh, Docker. And let me ask you, anybody of you has experience running database in Docker here? Anyone? No? Some? Mm, OK. Now, I think for databases, and that is, I think, very important, whatever environment we are looking for, it's very important to look at the two different use cases. One is a uh, uh, test and dev use case, where we often look at, hey, how can we get that as uh, mm, simple as possible, right? In this case, the simplicity and velocity is important. And then there is a production. Where in the production case, first and foremost, database should not crash, should not lose your data, should not expose this data to intruders, right? And we are often ready to pay for all that extra hassles in the production. 
Now, if you look at the test and dev, we see a lot of people using Docker, especially those who are using uh, Docker for other parts of their application because that really provides a lot of benefits. You can really have a, a database provisioned with Docker, which is a very clean and very consistent environment and doesn't have any other dependencies on paths, on libraries, or on anything else you may have in your uh, operating system. It's easy to have multiple environments if you uh, want to. And in uh, many cases, you can use uh, tools like Docker Compose to simplify the development of a full stack. Right, you can spin up your database, your app server, right, whatever you want uh, to do those things right there you know, on your machine. Now, in production, things are more complicated. First, as if any with, uh, what I would call like virtualization or kind of layering technology, uh, when you talk to a database, people they tend to be concerned about the overhead. Right, like I remember. People running database would be very concerned about virtualization a year ago, saying, oh, it has a lot of overhead. If you really want to get your best performance stability, you have to use a bare metal, right? Docker kind of transitioned in the same, uh, uh, same process, and especially as you look at some early Docker versions, some configurations, they did have overhead in the database. Well, a lot of those uh, have been fixed by now, right? And if you look at the modern Docker on uh, modern Linux, the overhead is quite minimal. But still, some people have rumors, oh my gosh, it will slow everything, mm, uh, everything out. Now, it, it also comes with some extra complexity, right, on uh, operational stuff, right? For example, well, uh, to configure things, you need to properly, you better to use data volumes because otherwise, when you just drop your Docker container, all your lovely database disappears with it, right? That is not your experience on Linux, where if you want to uninstall MySQL, Postgres, or whatever, well, that is not going to wipe your data, right? To take some uh, learning experience to do that. And also their observability and monitoring, as, at least initially with Docker, was kind of more uh, complicated. You couldn't get as much insight hmm, in your database operations if it's running on the Docker as you could if it's just running as a plain process or set of processes on, uh, on Linux. So what is the state of our uh, open source database right now with Docker? If you look at uh, most uh, databases, they have an official Docker images. Or at the very least, if they didn't have, then uh, Docker would have built that uh, uh, for them, right? So it's very easy. They are rather commonly deployed for uh, test and dev, but uh, they are not super commonly used in, uh, in production. So, what does Percona do in terms of Docker? What our approach? Well, obviously we provide also Docker packages, which we have uh, for uh, MySQL and uh, MongoDB. Uh, at this point, we do have uh, the ex uh, the, those for our extra per uh, software called Percona distribution. Again, Percona distribution for MySQL, Percona distribution for MongoDB, which is our uh, enhanced version of those products, which is uh, open source for MySQL and Postgres and source available for MongoDB, but which includes a number of uh, performance enhancement and enterprise features uh, with no uh, added cost. Now, what uh, would be the reason, in my opinion, for that relatively limited Docker usage in prod? And that, is, in my opinion, is what a lot of what we call day two operations are not really solved very well by using Docker alone. Right? If you're really running the database at scale for a long time, you kind of install it relatively rarely. Right? Typically, you have to deal with things like upgrades, you know, high ability. If your replication breaks, you have to figure out how to fix it. 
And Docker does not really simplify any of, of that. In fact, it allows you to provision multiple database instances in, in the same physical host or VM. While very important in development, it's not really that important in uh, production where we uh, often would want single database per VM, right? Like for if nothing else, uh, isolation uh, uh, reason, right? So a lot of problems which do not uh, make that operations much uh, easier. And here, I think that is where the Kubernetes brings us a great uh, solution. Now, if you're here on uh, this conference, I assume well, you already heard about Kubernetes, what it is, and I don't really uh, need to explain you uh, what the Kubernetes is, no more than I would explain you what, uh, uh, what Linux is. So let's talk about Kubernetes and databases in particular. I think Kubernetes and databases have, I would say, complicated relationships. Right, and had it from the early days. Because the concept of a Kubernetes first was thinking about stateless application and stateless ideas saying, hey, you know what, do everything stateless and that would be wonderful. But stateless database is kind of oxymoron, right? The database is where you have your state in a Kubernetes, uh, in, uh, uh, in Kubernetes term, right? So uh, that is where a lot of requirements were required going on from early Kubernetes version uh, for it to be able to run uh, databases. Right? And a lot of improvements were done through, hmm, uh, through last uh, several years. Right? I think uh, important things are, for example, uh, example their uh, different uh, uh, storage concepts right, with uh, persistent uh, volumes, the stateful set, right, which uh, are uh, very important in terms of how you deal with, uh, data, uh, with uh, databases and other stateful application in Kubernetes. And another third component which I find very important is the operator frameworks, which allowed to uh, have some very uh, complicated process to be run in the uh, in the Kubernetes clusters. Because unlike something like web applications, where you say maybe, well, I want to provision 50 instances of this stuff. And you know what? It doesn't matter in which order they come. They just, you know, came around. They're all equal and they will mm, you just happily work together. In a databases, typically as you bring up a database cluster, for example, the sequence is important. Right, you often depend on what a database technology is. You need to provision database in particular order, handle file failures in particular way, uh, and so on and so forth. Right, which uh, requires more controls, which now mm, we have. Now, even with that, I would say what we still have a number of uh, people which are rather uh, uh, impactful in the. Uh, Kubernetes communities like Casey Hightower is not particularly enthusiastic in the stateful applications in Kubernetes. Now, to be honest, I've been using that tweet for uh, about a couple of years now, so uh, we probably should check if uh, um, he changed his opinion, right? Because I think uh, sooner or later, right, <laughs> we will consider uh, Kubernetes uh, database capable, right? At least in a, in a certain uh, in a certain extent. Now, something else I want to ma uh, mention about uh, uh, about the Kubernetes. When we talk about uh, uh, Kubernetes, if you look about the people who want to argue a case about what you should not be running database on Kubernetes, they can tell you well. What if I have this 50 terabyte single instance, golden, whatever, like Oracle, Postgres, you name it. Can I really move it to a Kubernetes in terms of performance reasons, right? Or how it handles with that instance of a such huge size? And the answer probably may well be not yet, right? And the same answer we had 
in the past about virtualization or cloud, right? You would uh, really often keep your monster, very mission critical databases on bare metal well after you moved a lot of a smaller or less uh, uh, business critical databases to virtualized environments, right? Like for example, 15 years ago or so. I would see the same thing happen with uh, Kubernetes. Now what I think what is also interesting is what if all that talk about where Kubernetes is uh, mm, uh, helpful or not, right? We do have a number of uh, uh, vendors mm, which uh, stated uh, uh, publicly what they do use Kubernetes in their uh, database uh, as a service offering. And with that, we can uh, speculate uh, many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, database nodes are being run in production uh, right now um, in, in Kubernetes by those uh, cloud vendors alone, right? Obviously, in many of those uh, cases, they uh, either designed that from ground up to Kubernetes friendly or have uh, retrofitted uh, appropriately. Right, like for example, if you look at uh, planet scale, uh, the test folks, they are very specific to avoid running very large instances. They shard the database across many containers where each of them uh, would, be, uh, would be relatively tiny, no more than 256 gigabytes right, or something. Okay, so uh, uh, anyway, I think I spoke about this uh, already slightly, right, what a promise, uh, what Kubernetes have and how it can help us with a uh, with uh, databases, right? Operating system for your data center rather than a single server, which is important because if you look at the real production databases, because of a high availability framework, they uh, cannot really be managed within a concept of a single server. It has a very robust mechanics with a different uh, handle for different failures, right? And allows us to build the automation for handling that with uh, uh, operator frameworks. Now, if you think about the open source database on Kubernetes, it actually has a slower pick up uh, uh, by many vendors. And because of that, you will find what many third party operators are becoming available first. If you think about PostgreSQL, there has been a variety of uh, PostgreSQL operators in existence right now. None of them is really blessed, as I understand, as the one and only official solution for PostgreSQL Global Development Group. For uh, MySQL, Oracle mm, did not do the uh, operator for a very long time, right? I think they uh, just released the beta version of operator officially, right? It's not, G, uh, not GA yet. Right? And I think some of that is what for a lot of vendors, they're sort of conflicted about what their market position is. So if you look at somebody like Oracle, well, how does Oracle want you to run MySQL? Well, they want you to run MySQL on the Oracle Cloud, right? And if instead they provide you awesome MySQL operator, which you can use to run MySQL independently, you may be confused, and instead allowing Larry to get a bigger boat, you will just, you know, run your own uh, uh, MySQL uh, solution. Now, the Kubernetes uh, uh, solutions for uh, Kubernetes typically packaged either as Helm charts or operator uh, packages, or Helm chart which install the operator packages. Uh, in my opinion, you really want to look at the operators because uh, Helms, they help with the installation, but they generally on its own do not really help with all that kind of day two uh, operations which is really there uh, a lot of things uh, happen. 
from Percona, we are really focusing a lot uh, on, uh, on this market because we think there's a lot of potential for that in terms of being able to build uh, fully open source solutions. And uh, we have uh, operators for MySQL, MongoDB, and now uh, for Postgres uh, better, right? We have our own uh, branded operators because we want to make sure we can provide a very uniform experience for uh, different database uh, technologies. And these are available to install as operators or as a Helm chart. They work on majority of uh, um, managed Kubernetes solutions for public clouds or majority of uh, independent Kubernetes uh, distributions. Now, what are the unsolved problems with the Kubernetes and databases, as I think? Now, as I uh, mentioned, their stateful application of Kubernetes is kind of still kind of tricky. It is not uh, impossible, but it's not uh, trivial. And especially if you are looking at a mission critical database where you can never ever lose data, right, you really need to have significant Kubernetes experience to uh, uh, set it up. Where if you are not Kubernetes expert, it may not be hmm, uh, may not be easy for you, right? Even if you just, you know, learn to Google and kind of copy paste uh, some comments to get your stuff deployed on, uh, on Kubernetes, that probably is not going to be uh, enough. And compare that to their seductive simplicity, which we have uh, the major cloud vendors offer, right? Called uh, database uh, as a service. Database as a service experience, that means what you, as a developer, can provision the database with a simple API call, a couple of clicks, which will do a lot of stuff for you, right? Manage availability, maybe backups included, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, what is the current state of a database as a service solutions? Well, if you look in this case, is all the major cloud uh, providers, they have proprietary database as a service uh, uh, offerings, right? And of course. Now, even tier two providers, you think something like DigitalOcean or uh, Linode, uh, no, Linode doesn't have one, but the DigitalOcean, right, of, or some uh, providers in, you know, country specific like uh, Alibaba in China or Yandex in Russia, they all would have database as a service uh, providers uh, as well. Now, we also have a database vendors. Typically, everybody now is building their own proprietary solution. Obviously, uh, MongoDB has Atlas, SkySQL from uh, MariaDB, you have a Cockroach Cloud, you, you have solution of data stacks from InfluxDB, right? I mentioned whatever technology is, typically it's going to have a cloud uh, vendor. And there is uh, also a third party solution, so like uh, Avian, right, or InstaCluster folks, right, who are presenting here on the, uh, the show. They also have a uh, solution for uh, databases, right, and while the database itself may be open source, fully open source and not modified, then this kind of a management layer on the top of that is typically uh, proprietary which uh, creates a certain uh, locking. Now, I believe database as a service is uh, as amazing, right? Uh, which gives you their uh, fantastic, uh, mm, fantastic development experience, right? Can have managed availability, database patching automatically, backups, maybe some performance tuning, right? Better than running databases before uh, default, providing you like easy kind of push a button or swipe a credit card, ability to scale, right, if you're running uh, uh, slow. But also, uh, it is, uh, has a, you know, challenges if you uh, really uh, love an open source uh, approach in uh, your life. Because, as I mentioned, they're not open source. Many of them would advertise what they are open source compatible, 
right? And that is specific, especially the problem with the heavily modified solutions, right? Think about Amazon Aurora, right? Which, well, it has what MySQL or Postgres can do, right? But, and also other things, but what that means, if you fully adopt all Aurora features, then you cannot really run on the open source database even besides their uh, management framework. What open source compatible uh, often uh, means is uh, uh, what, hey, this technology allows you to move to the cloud, to our solution, right? And we don't particularly uh, expect you to need to move back, right? Another thing what we noticed uh, with database uh, uh, as a service is uh, what cloud vendors like to call it fully managed. Right, you can see that in any kind of public cloud environment, while it is not really quite fully managed. Right? You will find, uh, for example, uh, a lot of security incidents recently, they correspond to some uh, public uh, hmm, cloud and databases uh, out there, and then you can learn, well, what security is shared responsibility, right? Well, as frankly it uh, should be. Or you may learn what, uh, while uh, uh, from performance optimization there are, you know, certain things which is done for you, the cloud vendors are not going to really work with you to see what kind, how to design your schema or optimize your queries and on, on so on and so forth. Right? In uh, many cases, at least at the base incarnation of that, uh, uh, of that uh, management services. So mm, I think uh, the main thing with database as a service, what I would say, is what uh, it is it comes with a lock-in, and while it's uh, uh, maybe uh, painful now for some, in terms of a cost premium, you have to pay for that. It is likely to be even more painful in the future. Right? Why am I saying that? Well, if you look at the Amazon RDS, which I think is an interesting example here because it was around for a long time. The first generation of the RDS uh, had, I think, 30 or 40 percent price premium compared to what your kind of uh, the hardware to provision it would be. Now, if you look at the latest uh, Graviton-powered instances, the price premium is about 2x, right? So you essentially have to uh, double uh, your uh, spend, right, and pay for half for hardware, half for uh, the software mm, uh, in the end. And that is for RDS, which is relatively unmodified MySQL or Postgres. If you're going for Aurora, uh, right, which is positioned as more advanced database, that is going to be either uh, more. Now, I think in that is a case where history may continue repeating itself, right? And if you don't know uh, this uh, guy right there, this is my, uh, my friend Larry. Uh, from, uh, from Oracle, uh, and uh, if you think of how the Oracle was started and what Oracle was doing, it was actually saving people from the lock-in of a big blue dominance, right, in the early days. You would have to run by this kind of mainframe to run a database on them, which would become really expensive, or you can mm, get Oracle, right, and run it on a smaller, uh, smaller computers. But we know, well, what as that technology got uh, adopted uh, uh, sub uh, substantially, it became, uh, well, uh, expensive to a point is what many folks in our space, in the database space, are looking to find a way how we can migrate from you know, Oracle to the open source databases not because Oracle is bad database, right? Many uh, people I talk to, they say what well, Oracle engineering is fantastic and Oracle database is great, but well, you know what? If it's keeping Larry happy and losing my job, right, or moving to open source software, then 
uh, you know, uh, we better do that. What I think is interesting in this case, uh, in the cloud, is also how uh, cloud was hmm, advertised versus how it is advertised right now. You can see this uh, slideshow is actually from some very old AWS presentation. It even has old AWS logo. And what we see they have promoted cloud at the times it wasn't so known. Uh, what the cloud is very similar to the electricity, right? It doesn't make sense for you to uh, make your own electricity unless it's in some uh, exceptional cases. It's much mm, easier to buy it, and we all, or for most of us, uh, do that. But I think what is important with electricity, though, is electricity is commodity, right? And uh, in uh, uh, and you either have access to kind of multiple vendors, right? Where you can maybe choose which are kind of easily replaceable ones, or if not, then that is really kind of heavily regulated as utility, so government doesn't really allow the only company who provides the power in the region to really skin you alive, right? Well, if you look at the cloud, it is kind of different, right? It's kind of saying, well, if you buy electricity from us, right, and then we'll also sell you TV, but it will only work if you get a power grid from us, right? I wouldn't make, uh, 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 make, uh, make my, uh, much sense, would it? But that is exactly what a lot of the cloud vendors are uh, focused on. If you look at this case and to talk about um, cloud vendors uh, on the kind of uh, high level, right, to learn what is the best practices to use in Amazon or Google or uh, Azure, it always would be use as many this kind of a highly value proprietary services as possible. Use DynamoDB or Aurora, right, or Redshift or uh, stuff like that, right? Those folks are not going to sell, hey, you know what? Just use a commodity stuff such as, you know, compute services and build the stuff uh, of a value on the open source, for example, on the uh, Kubernetes platform. But that is what well makes sense uh, uh, for you, right? And I think that makes sense for us as a, a community because while open source is kind of uh, uh, not as easy to use in the cloud yet as uh, those uh, uh, cloud solutions, uh, native cloud solutions, I think it will get there. I mean, on my memory, I think uh, uh, open source often takes a time to get there to match the level of performance or usability compared to the proprietary software, but with enough uh, folks focusing on that, uh, it gets there. You guys probably uh, rem uh, remember the situation with, uh, uh, with Linux, right? I mean, I remember starting to use Linux in 1999, I think, right? And at that point, I would talk to Solaris folks, right, or some others, and they would tell me, oh, what a joke. Really, that is an operating system which cannot even handle files more than two gigabytes in size? You know, if somebody <laughs> remember those uh, uh, challenges, right? Or, or you know what, oh, you are restricted to those, like, 2.7 gigabytes of memory, right, with 32-bit kernels, right, or uh, stuff like that. Mm, it is a joke, right, compared to the Linux, real Unix operating systems. But they have been replaced. The same happened, let's say, in the web browser, not web browser, but uh, the web server space, right, where you would have uh, initial property solutions where almost completely wiped out by whatever it's like Apache, Mm, uh, and Nginx-based uh, 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 solutions. Uh, with database space, you cannot say what Oracle is gone, but if you look at development for new applications, 
I think very few of those really happen at those legacy property databases. It's, it really goes into their open source slash open core source available uh, whatever database technologies. Well, anyway, so in, in our case, uh, our vision in terms of what is the alternative for kind of more open source friendly uh, way to run database in the cloud is really to use the Kubernetes as a universal API for public and uh, private cloud, because one of the things about it, it is uh, pretty ubiquitous, right? It exists on, a, all, on pretty much every major uh, public cloud as well as uh, many uh, private cloud um, uh, solutions. And uh, uh, what uh, uh, we have been doing um, in this case is uh, building uh, their uh, sort of a graphical user interface and API uh, gateway, which really allows you to get that database as a service experience right, from the open source uh, solution, right, and again, uh, in the environment you uh, completely control. Now, it is work in progress, right, it's, uh, you can think about that as, uh, as, uh, as better uh, uh, right now, right, but uh, 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 we are uh, going to get there. And I actually hope what uh, we are not uh, going to be the only vendor who invests in making sure what that uh, usability piece is only offered in the proprietary package, right? Now, one question I got uh, uh, in this case is saying, well, Peter, if you talk about the database as a service and open source, how do you uh, exactly think about it, right? Because if you look at database as a service for folks like Amazon, Google, and so on and so forth, they combine their, uh, their software piece, right, with obviously their uh, the people piece, right? And you don't often know their, uh, you know, what, even what is what, right? For example, if you're having Amazon Aurora or uh, RDS, if something breaks because of a software bug, they may update software, fix it, without you even, mm, even know that, right? So what I think about database as a service is uh, this kind of um, uh, two mm, uh, different components. One is your interface. As a developer, as a user, a database as a service experience, that means you can provide the full, uh, get a full database experience, provide the cluster, uh, right, mm, uh, with uh, simple actions. If I want to up update my database cluster to the new version, for example, it doesn't mean, oh, I now have to figure out how to up install the new packages on 25 nodes, but I can click a button to update a cluster or have an API call, right? Mm, uh, some, uh, uh, something like that. And that is something where open source is very suited for. Now, when you speak about the complete the management piece, right, mm, that is where you need some humans to be involved. Because wherever great software we build, as many as artificial intelligence, self-healing, and whatever buzzwords you want to include in that, there are going to be cases when a software is going to fail in some unusual pace, and at least at this point of a state of artificial intelligence, we still need humans to go and resolve the complicated problems, right? And that is where you even need to have that uh, uh, capacity in-house, you know, same as many companies do right now, right? Or have some partner you know, to do that with. So if you look as a summary, well, you think about the open source uh, databases, right? They are uh, really have a traveling this path from containers to a database as a service uh, functionality right now. Docker support, as I would say, is, is very mature. Kubernetes uh, is uh, getting there. And I think that we are in the relatively early stages having a fully open source database uh, solution um, uh, right now. 
right? With that, uh, to finish it up in a simple words, I would say what I really believe is A, what the database as a service really have won hearts and minds of developers because it really gives us unparalleled simplicity and convenience of using the database. I also believe what a software vendor locking sucks, right? Uh, and uh, I think uh, many people know that. Even pe more people are going to learn that, sometimes very hard and unpleasant way. And I think, as with many things uh, before, that is where the open source will come to the rescue. That's all I have. And if you folks have some questions, I would be happy to answer. Can you talk a little bit more about this work in progress? Is this the uh, work to make Kubernetes a universal API, or is that already done? Or what is it that you Okay, so what we, uh, uh, what we have Mm, from uh, uh, our sons. We have a uh, project, uh, uh, PMAM, Percona Monitoring and Management, right? Which does have a database uh, as a service functionality, which is in beta, where basically you can uh, register your Kubernetes cluster in it, right? And then you have the GUI and set of APIs where you can provision uh, the database clusters, kind of scale them up, down, upgrade, give this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of process. Does that answer your question? So it's limited specifically to the distributions of Well, n that's right. That is uh, spe specifically for the uh, distributions per corner is offering, but there is also something uh, 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 I think important here from the uh, two parts. Is uh, A, well, uh, uh, it is uh, the completely open source project including our distributions. Uh, B, we are always building software in a way, even if something what uh, uh, we do not necessarily need ourselves as a company because our customers, they uh, run per corner variant of software. We uh, want to make it easy and pluggable for our people uh, to build what they, uh, what they want, right? So if you look at, hey, you know what? I want to uh, really use that sort of internal API to, let's say, provision Redis, which you don't support, right? To have uh, our own, uh, uh, you know, package of Postgres, right? Or whatever. We are uh, very welcome uh, people uh, doing that. And again, that's good, good open source, that's what makes it possible. Okay, any other thoughts, questions? Come on, nobody's going to say, Peter, you're on, that's complete bullshit. No? Oh, the lady on behind, thank you. Okay. What do you suggest companies do who are doing you know, some other thing and they want to migrate to this type of... You know, okay, so what I would... Uh, uh, what I would say is, uh, is this, right? If you look at the open source database as a service, right? As I mentioned, I am not aware of complete package which is GA quality right, uh, right now, right? So at some extent you can say, well, you know what? Uh, uh, stay put, right? But in your plans, I would encourage to understand what that is coming. And that is probably coming both from us as per corner and from uh, from other, uh, other vendors because I think there is a big need for that in the market. And, you know, as happened in open source, we typically have variety of solutions coming up, right? That's uh, one thing. The other thing, and, and that's again, depends on uh, what scale of a company you are, right? I think it's uh, important to know what we can achieve more together, right? So if you say, hey, that is, sounds interesting, hey, can we work together to meet our needs faster? Yes, uh, uh, let's do that. And just as a follow-up question, moving from one database to a different database is hard and requires a lot of testing and it's really, I mean, there's risk and you don't know if you're going to get it perfect and so forth. So does it, like, does Corna help with that aspect too, that just to get a, a sense of this is going to be, you can apply less risk to 
Well, uh, you're right, right? And I think if you're speaking about the uh, moving of databases, right, it, there is always kind of a risk, right? Even if you're moving from, uh, I don't know, say, PostgreSQL 13 to 14, right? It's not going to be like uh, completely. But if you are moving from completely different database technologies, let's say, hey, I want to move from Oracle to Postgres, right? That's even more risk and uh, and complexity, right? And uh, yes, uh, with Pircon and uh, and our partner, that is something we can help, both from the database one technology to another, from one cloud to another, from cloud to on-prem, or from on-prem to a cloud. We have a lot of experience uh, doing that. Peter, just to clarify your point on the uh, things that aren't create quality, you're not talking specifically about operators or databases running on Kubernetes. You're talking about the whole. Experience. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, th thank you, uh, Matt. Right. Yeah. So there are kind of three levels, if you look. Right. The distributions, which is JA quality, right? Then you have uh, operators, which are the second layer. We have MGA for MongoDB and MySQL and better for uh, uh, for Postgres, right? Which is going GA, I think, in a month or so. And then this kind of uh, GUI slash API, that is what is work in progress. Yeah, thanks, Matt, for uh, clarifying that. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns? Well, uh, if no, then that's uh, all I uh, had for you folks. And I can get you out of here a couple of minutes early.